right. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I, my name is Iona Crabtree. I am the Clark Library Fellow XR Researcher for Studio X, the hub for extended reality at the University of Rochester. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. This series is made possible by Kathy McMoran Murray and the National Science Foundation as part of the interdisciplinary graduate training in science, technology, and applications of augmented and virtual reality at the University of Rochester. I would like to thank Dr. Messina L. Holmes Morris for joining us today. Dr. Morris is a former interim department chair, assistant professor of chemistry, and is now the in the Department of Education and Assistant Profession of Education for the Center of Morehouse for Excellence and oh, sorry, <laughs> Education of Morehouse Center for Excellence in Education, MCEE, at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Morris is Morehouse is Morehouse's college. Morehouse Colleges, I am so sorry. <laughs> Dr. Morris is Morehouse College's 2021 winner of the Vulcan Teaching Award of Excellence. She is an alumna of Clark and Atlanta University, a Bachelor's of Science, and Emory University, a Master's of Science and PhD. Her research interests focus on inclusion in STEM for the neurodiverse. She is the Principal Investigator, PI, of the VR project Morehouse in the Metaverse. She launched her advanced inorganic chemistry course in virtual reality in the spring of 2021. She's a pioneer in this space as the chemistry content in VR is limited. She is the wife of a gamer techie named Chris and mom of five sons, Anthony, Matthew, Christopher, Seth, and Cameron. She believes VR provides a pathway for creating inclusion in society for the neurodivergent through immersive educational experiences that more specifically target vocational rehabilitation goals. As a member of the Autism Speaks Community Advisory Council, Advocacy Ambassadors and Grant Review Committee, Dr. Morris sheds light on the issues that affect one in 44 children and one in 45 adults on the autism spectrum. Her teaching philosophy centers around building a rapport with students before asking them to perform, and she infuses metacognitive goals as part of her learning objectives in the classroom to help students persist through their educational experiences. She's effectively known as Dr. MOM, Molder of Minds, by all her students. She continues to mold the minds of educators and students globally in the metaverse. Her future is authentic transformation of the educational system for future leaders using immersive technologies in the metaverse. More recently, she founded Metaverse United LLC, where she helps people find where they belong in the embodiment of the internet called the metaverse. Learn more at unitethemetaverse.com. During the talk, please feel free to post your questions in the chat. We will have a Q&A at the end. Lastly, the session is being recorded and will be available to you later on on the Studio X website. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much, Ayana, for the beautiful introduction. And don't worry, I flub up stuff all the time. Don't worry, it's about to be a whole show in here. Um, I am Messina Morris, and I am so grateful to have made it to Friday. You know, so much can happen in a week. <laughs> and so I am going to show my screen and overshare about my life and talk about finding joy in the journey through XR. I thank Megan for finding me and inviting me to the University of Rochester's Voices of XR seminar series. I'm grateful to be here. I represent Morehouse College and the Professional and Continuing Studies Division in the Education Department. Messina, that's a big old name and it means beneficent. You might be thinking, who are these folks on this picture, these pictures? I pilfered through these pictures because I felt like my origin story was important. The metaverse is about building a new world beyond what exists now, beyond what we can even imagine or think or believe. And if I'm gonna pioneer this thing, then I need to know my own origin story. And I was quite clear about that. Why was I a chemist? What even brought me to this? How did I become this curious child? Well, I have a brother. His name is Gordon Leonard Holmes Jr. And this is, this is him. So Gordy on this picture was four years old and he was born normal. He was actually a, a child prodigy. 
And at the age of four, he was stricken with spinal meningitis by hemophilus influenza B. Um, it crossed the blood brain barrier and it caused meningitis in him. And he and a few other students um, actually had it in his daycare. And a couple of students passed. One was left uh, a, a vegetable and he was left with a traumatic brain injury. His fever was 108 and it left him brain damaged. So this is Gordy, probably at about age 12. I was born when he was eight years old. And so I never knew this Gordy, but I did know this Gordy. This Gordy sparked in me an interest to figure out how I could help explain to my family what happened to my brother's brain. And so as a young child, I was curious and I mixed a lot of flower water and everything else I could figure out to concoct a cure because I was gonna fix my brother. But I was also very empathetic. I always was trying to help someone, help my mom be happy, help my family because my brother had seizures. He was left with terrible epileptic seizures. He had a shunt, so he had encephalitis. He had other conditions that, uh, where he had had a stroke. So he had a lot of other medical conditions and we were always heightenedly aware of what was going on. So I grew up really, really fast. This is my beautiful mom who was always there to support this young, curious child who was very different, didn't speak till I was four years old. And I knew that there was something very different about me. This is my mom and myself and my brother Gordy later on in life. But Messina means beneficent, charitable, good doer of God and all these other things. But my mom gave me this big old name for some reason she knew that I was going to do something really great. My middle name is Latifa. And if you look me up on, on Facebook, then you'll see that one of my names is Dr. Latifa. And people always say, they think that that's my actual name, but it's not, but it is my middle name and it means delicate and sensitive. And I mentioned this as a part of my origin story because it is a part of who I am. So this is me as a little, little one. I think I might've been about three on this picture, but uh, I was a big old cry baby. Everything, it seemed like anything, the wind blew, I, I could feel it. I, I could feel people's emotions. I always, like I said, wanted to fix the whole world, but I was really, really bright and inquisitive. But I also had a mom that made sure that we stayed in our books. So literally in our kitchen, this was our kitchen growing up, we had desks. And after school, we had to study. And this is me winning awards. And this is me winning more awards. And this is me studying after school, because in order to be in extracurricular activities, my mama insisted that we had tutorial time. And this is me at a cotillion as a senior in high school. But I was a real sensitive child and I was really aware that in order to achieve, I had to make sure that I studied and I practiced and I was poised and trained to be exactly in the position that I am now. So part of this journey of joy and learning who you are and being self-aware is in the practice. So there's joy in the journey. Unicorn rainbows and being an INFP. So if you know Myers-Briggs personality testing and I'm a, my teaching philosophy, philosophy is making sure that my students, uh, that I have a rapport with my students before I ask them to perform. And Part of that is I make them take this personality test. I had a teacher in high school who made us learn how we learn. So he did metacognition a long time ago. Um, and I graduated from high school in 1996. So he was training us on how we thought and, and what our gifts and talents were. But it's interesting because I had a, another teacher, I was, and he was a chemistry teacher. So he's the one that sparked my real interest in like, oh, I could be a chemist. And, um, but this, this lady, I was looking through my yearbook and I was a junior at this time. And her name was Christina Dobo. She was a physicist. I, I don't, it's not that I don't like physics. 
I just, it didn't ever click for me like that. I like math. And so that's what made physics make sense to me because it was math based. But this is me doing physics experiments and I learned by doing. So she was doing this physics experiment with me. And, um, but I was also a very well-rounded student. So an INFP is a visionary and they're a dreamer, which goes back to me being this beneficent, this delicate, sensitive person, but I was always a humanitarian. So here I am as class president, uh, junior class president of 1996 in my yearbook. Here I am as one of the co-captains of the dance team um, in the biggest band in the quote unquote land in Decatur, Georgia, um, cause that's where I'm from. But this is what my physics teacher wrote to me. And I was like, wow, she took time to draw in different colors, shades and everything. But she says, oh, little Messina, always one step ahead of the rest, just a little prettier, just a little more sophisticated, just smarter. I hope the future brings fruition to the potential within you because roses are red and violets are blue. The world is an oyster for someone like you. Reach high, Miss Dobo. And I was like, you know, when you have people that pour life into you at such a young age, it makes a great impact. And that is why I do what I do now, because I had people who poured into me all throughout my life. And that's been the greatest blessing of my life. So as I stand here before you, I stand as one, but really I truly stand as many. So this is my CV and I come to you as Dr. Messina Holmes Morris, that I'm very proud and I'm very grateful to be able to tell you about the joy that XR has brought to my life and how I got here, but I didn't get here alone and I don't stand here alone. So I do have a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Clark Atlanta University. And I was a child that really did come from humble means because it was four of us in my family. And I had a large family with a special needs brother and my family was, uh, my mom couldn't work. And so we lived off of one income and we didn't have much. So um, I have my, I went to school off a of scholarship and I was a first generation college student. And then I got my master's and PhD full fellowship um, in biomolecular chemistry from Emory University. I began my life as an educator. I had a, a, a fellowship in education from Emory University where we went into the K-12 classroom and implemented problem-based learning into K-12 education. And then I became a high school teacher at first and got certified in education and I've been certified ever since. So my transition from chemistry, pure chemistry into the education department for me is not, is not surprising. It's kind of like, I've always been an innovator in education. I've always used different learning strategies in education always. And I taught chemistry, but I always wanted students to understand how they learn best. Um, and now as the director of Morehouse in the Metaverse, and let me go to the next slide, because even though you see that first picture, now you can see me as my avatars, which are face-enabled avatars that my students see every time I go into different spaces. Um, I learned that as we do it across disciplines, teaching pre-service teachers how to use this type of technology and innovation is even more powerful. So regardless of the discipline, it's necessary for them to understand and to harness this type of power because this is the next wave of where education is going and we need to have our teachers ready to be able to use this in their own classroom. I'm also the PI of my own research laboratory group where we help build 21st century skills and to include those with neurodiverse learning challenges in STEM. Why am I so adamant about inclusion in STEM for those who are neurodiverse. Well, I have five sons, but I also have, a, well, two of my sons have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Autism affects one in 44 young people um, and one in 45 live, adults live with autism. It's really important because 85% of those adults are unemployed regardless of educational stance. So they could be high functioning and they still are unemployed. 
And so it's important for me to help them develop 21st century skills like collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking so that they can best be used in the workplace and then help people in the workplace understand how to best utilize their skills as well. So that is what I do. And I just soft launched my own company, uh, Metaverse United, which helps people do the same thing that I do in the classroom with metacognition by helping my students understand how to best persist in STEM and build their own STEM identities by helping people understand where they belong in the metaverse space. So Metaverse United, what I learned through my entire journey this past two years by being in XR is you need to help people find where they belong in the metaverse but more, more than that is that you need to be your own competition. This journey that we're on called life is more about you and less about anybody else. And that's the most important thing that you can learn in life. And so once I learned that I was my own competition, everything else started to become easier. So. I'm still defining what the metaverse space is, but what I keep hearing over and over again is how people don't really understand where they belong in this space. And so I wanted to create a place where people understood a little bit more about it. I wanted to create a place where people felt like there was a sense of community, where there was ownership, where there was governance, where there were discussions around education, where there was discussions around community. And it's so it was really about finding this collaborative space, this hub of sorts, where you can go through and go to and figure out your niche in this space because it's going to take all of us to build this magnificent space that we call the metaverse. So I always say the metaverse has to be built by all of us. So you can find me at unitethemetaverse.com simply because it's not going to take one of us. It's going to literally take all of us to do it. So people need to know from Generation Alpha all the way to Baby Boomers how they can be useful and how they can bring all their gifts and talents to the table. So how am I successful? Well, family always comes first, uh, right after my faith. And I am a total daddy's girl and I have a total girl dad. Uh, so I have to pay homage to my father who is still living by the way. But this guy was a, was a vet. So, you know, shout out to all the, the veterans um, that keep us safe in the United States and free. Uh, but my dad loves me, like that's us right here. And more than that, my dad made, he worked for Southern Bell. So why am people like, you're a chemist, so why do you like tech? I like tech because my dad bought me my first computer. My dad was the reason why I had a Commodore 64, why I played Donkey Kong, why I'm a total gamer girl. He was the one that championed me. Uh, playing Super Mario Brothers and beating it and would stay up with me all night long. <laughs> My mama would be fussing because she wanted me to be sitting at the desk. <laughs> and he was the one that was like, get that girl a color TV because she got all A's so she could play her game. And so I have to shout out my dad because it was my mom that made me study hard, but it was my dad that made sure that I knew tech because he worked in telecom and he found that to be very important. So uh, my dad is 74 this year and my dad literally still texts. He will video message. He's on all social media platforms and he will probably watch this video first and send me and probably like share it on his story. So uh, shout out daddy. He might be in the audience if, if that is open. <laughs> Uh, but I am also a mom and I am single mom in it right now because my husband is out of town and I have a four-year-old that is running rampant because it is Friday and his school is out now and he is home and in the room. So if you hear a little person who is definitely making noise in the background, I just dropped my cup from a high shelf camera.
Go go back into the room like mommy asked you. Cameron, go back into the room like mommy asked you. Cameron, go back into the room like mommy asked you. Thank you. I do apologize. So I am single mom in it right now, but I have five boys. They are 26, 23, 16, 14, and four. Don't ask me what I was thinking. Just know that I have a traumatic brain injury for some reason. I don't know. But I started all over again. And the gift is that child that just uh, was the highlight of your Friday. So just call it that. But my real why for why I advocate so hard besides my special needs brother is this young man right here, Seth. So Seth and I wrote a book called Seth Can Do All Things because he has autism and has moderate support needs. My little one, Cameron, who just came in here and dropped that cup, he has he was diagnosed through a sibling study and had early intervention. And you can hardly tell that he has autism at all. Um, he got services very early on and no one can tell at all. And he's very communicative. Seth was diagnosed uh, later. And I am not quite sure what his outcome in life will be, but I am building a place in this world so that he can exist in this world independently. And even though he's limited verbal, he's still academically, uh, we're still working on him academically and building his legacy. And he participates in sports and all that kind of thing but I advocate heavily in the autism community for uh, him and in my research and even in this metaverse space because look out for uh, an institute for those who have autism because I align myself with the goals and the needs of those who cannot speak or advocate for themselves. So I am a family first oriented person and I am grateful for my family and for those who have held me up I am also grateful for the opportunities that have been presented to me at Morehouse College. Dr. M-O-M or Dr. Mom is what my students insist on calling me. So I am a boy mom, just like I am a daddy's girl. And my dad is a girl dad. I am Dr. Mom to 2100 young black boys at Morehouse College ages 18 to 23 or beyond even. Um, this is uh, a historically black men's liberal arts college in Atlanta, Georgia. It's one of the largest men's liberal arts colleges in the United States. Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s alma mater, Julian Bond, Spike Lee, Samuel Jackson are all notable alums. And we call our alumni Morehouse men. So Senator Raphael Warnock is also one of them. And um, there are many numerous African-American young men that come out of Morehouse and are doing wonderful, exciting, exhilarating things. And we hold them to a very high standard and uh, being first to have a metaversity campus uh, complete with not just academics, but also uh, extracurricular activities and co-curricular activities is a part of that. So the mission of Morehouse College is to develop men with disciplined minds who will lead lives of leadership and service. And while I was talking about being Dr. Mom, the M-O-M stands for a molder of minds. So I am molding their minds, just like we're supposed to develop men with disciplined minds. I am keen on not just developing their minds, but also the hearts of these disciplined minds, because that's important. So I'm asking you all a question, just to pose to yourself. If you felt like over the last couple of years, you've lost your joy. So I, I thought about it because I, I've taken some hits in the last couple of years with my family my faith, my family, and my career, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, it might look all glossy because I smile through it, but it hasn't been. Um, but there are times throughout our life where we do lose our joy. Um, 
but we don't have to. We can we can always find a little sliver of joy. And when you find that, you follow it. And that's what I've learned through XR. So I had a student. <clears throat> this student's name um, for anonymity's sake is John. John was a physics dual degree major. And he came to me. It was like eight o'clock in the morning. Y'all, if you know me, I, I get up early because I'm a mama. <clears throat> but I don't get up early because I, I want to get up with the roosters. I get up early because that's the only time mamas get time to be by themselves. So, um, but he came up to me at eight o'clock in the morning and he said, I sent you an email last night. And he did. And I, I do check my emails all the time and I'm pretty responsive. I give my students my cell phone number. That's just how I work because I want to build a rapport with my students. So I give this young man, you know, a response, tell him, you know, come see me tomorrow. I didn't expect him to meet me like on my way to the office, but he did. And I gave him my time because that's what I do because someone saw me. So I, I aim to see my students and he wanted to change his major from physics. He just, he just couldn't take it anymore, but he knew that it was going to be a, a, a feat because changing from physics to chemistry at the time that he was changing, and he had some neurodiverse learning challenges, and he knew that I was an advocate for students with neurodiverse learning issues, and he had a speech impediment too, and he had some anxiety issues, and so he just didn't feel like anybody acknowledged what he was going through. And he was kind of self-conscious and he felt like I could help him. And so we talked, did his paperwork. I told him I'd follow him, you know, and, and mentor him and work with him because that's what I do. That's who I am. I was a little girl who wanted to be seen. I had people who saw me, who helped me, and now I'm here. And I feel like it's my duty and my responsibility to do the same for others. Um, as the pandemic hit, we were thrust. So John stayed in chemistry. He was doing pretty okay, fairly all right. But then the pandemic hit and I was trying to find out other ways in which our students could learn because our students were zoomed out. And then I meet this guy, Steve Grubb, and they became our partners in virtual reality. They helped design the digital twin campus of Morehouse College. And they helped us create the content. So at first I was really not interested because they didn't have enough chemistry content. And they, they helped me develop the chemistry content. Like all of the modules I designed along with their software de developers. So they designed the three dimensional sets using the Unity platform. But then like they helped me learn how to bring three dimensional assets and IFX objects into the space. And I went through literally from, it took 60 days to get this class up and running because that's how passionate about making sure that our students were not just zooming through uh, the rest of the pandemic um, we were. So spring 2021, we implemented this uh, VR classroom. So we collaborated across disciplines. We did it in, in at first, when we first implemented, we did it in biology, men's health 105, which is the first year experience course that was taught by Dr. Ethel Vereen. We did it um, in history 112, world history 112, taught by Dr. Ovell Hamilton. We did it in my advanced in organic chemistry. I did it in the lab class because we had more than two hours to do it. And then we did it in we, we had it slated for an English course called Blacks in Wonderland, but that course didn't make that semester. So we did cross-disciplinary lessons with that professor, Dr. Tanya Clark, which ended up being the best lessons. I just presented on that at the American Chemical Society Conference in San Diego Tuesday. So I just actually came back on the plane Wednesday from San Diego. Um, but we did collaborative efforts across all disciplines. And now it's been implemented in sociology and journalism 
and now general chemistry, analytical chemistry, microbiology, um, plus the other world history 111, um, research lab groups. Um, now we're moving into working with the library to game. We did a game day. We are doing Meditation Mondays in the Metaverse. We did a gala for uh, our Candle in the Dark, which is our donor, um, donor where our biggest like uh, sponsor donor gala um, for Founders Day. But we're doing a whole lot. But this is what John ended up saying about his experience in virtual reality and how it transformed him. But he didn't think that he was going to even walk across the stage, but he did graduate. And this is what he said about virtual reality. I believe that virtual reality is the future of education, at least in STEM. I mean, I think if we're going to learn how to do science at the highest level at which creator science do it, we have to have the best tools possible. And this is one of them. So he felt like it was the best thing that could have happened to him and that this is how STEM should be happening. And now... It gave him the confidence that he needed to be successful. He graduated from Morehouse, which he didn't think. He said he never thought he would. He was a first-generation college student, too. And he's an educator now for elementary and middle school students. He was like, Dr. Morris, I don't even know how you ever did it. But uh, he is a successful teacher. So he is doing well post-graduation. He is happy. He is thriving. And he is building the next generation. And now he wants to know how can he implement virtual reality? So we are doing some outreach with other schools as well on um, training educators on implementing this through the Morehouse Center for Excellence in Education. So we're developing innovative teachers in education, pre-service teachers, and providing uh, students in computer science and biology with the option to become certified educators. Our department chair, Dr. Nina Gilbert, actually sees an enormous vision for how to use Morehouse in the metaverse and align that with all of the goals and objectives for what it means to be a certified uh, teacher, regardless to what discipline you're in. And she is a, 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 just a dynamo, and we work well together in that. She is, uh, we're also implementing self-care. So some people use a like top-down version to work with educators or a bottom-up. And I'll tell you what that means. So we are doing outreach with a lab school. We have par educational partners through a charter school in an underserved community called Utopian Academy. Uh, their principal, Dr. Artesius Miller, is a Morehouse graduate. And he's also an adjunct professor in our education department. So he has, um, you know, everyone has had trauma and a lot of things that have happened during the pandemic. And what we decided to do, instead of focusing on increasing student achievement by looking at how can we align with just helping the educator, I mean, helping the administration, like get their data together, like what data points can they look at? How can they change the structure of the school, do more professional development, implement more programs, that kind of thing. That's the top down model. Um, then instead of doing the bottom up model, like what kind of diverse learning uh, strategies can we use? What kind of other tools can students have? What kind of small groups can we use? Active learning strategies, all those kind of things. That's the bottom up model. We always look at the student. In my estimation, and having been in the classroom, no one ever looks at the teacher. They do professional development, but that does not really affect the teacher's presence. The teacher is in the classroom being a caregiver to students all day long. And nobody thinks about the well-being of the teacher. So we started Meditation Mondays in the Metaverse for our students at Morehouse because of the traumas that HBCUs have endured through bomb threats, um, through Black History Month, uh, through like just COVID and all the trauma. And that we saw suicide and homicide rates between 18 and 23 be like 69% for young Black men. And that rate is 20% time um, percentage points higher than it is for the United States in general for 
age range is 18 to 23. So we found that to be a problem. And so we implemented immersive technology to just help with mindfulness and mental well-being. So I started thinking about how can we help educators have a better mental well-being? And maybe if the educator was better or felt better or had a better presence, you know, of mind, then maybe that would correlate to student achievement. We don't know, but there's no studies on it. So I figured we'd be the first. So if we're talking about excellence in education, then let's look at how we can make the educator feel better about being present every day. But I know it's hard to be an educator, just like it's hard to do all things um, when it comes to helping and inspiring children. But how can you also inspire a John? What can you do? I say everyone should have their own metaversity. Everyone should actually try it. Um, this is a little bit of, of what we have done at Morehouse, and it's just a sped up clip of what our campus looks like. We made virtual reality classroom. How can you restore joy? Remain creative about your pedagogical, pedagogical approach. Utilize your students as creators. Create a climate that is similar to what your students experience on campus. There are details that actually matter in scenes. Make your students feel engaged. So we focused on creating culturally responsive spaces. I say collaborate with faculty across disciplines. It does really make a difference to see someone in humanities and STEM come together and create content. It makes students retain knowledge more and to actually feel like hmm, this has an impact in other areas besides just mine. Um, work in teams as much as possible and share spaces. Lean in, like I have the framework, I'm willing to help. I am the blueprint, I didn't have one, but I am willing to help you succeed. So in any way, utilize me and bring your school back to life because at this moment, just like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we have before us a glorious opportunity to inject a new dimension of love into the veins of our civilization. So use VR education to restore and transform the landscape of education as it never has been done before. These are outcomes from implementing a metaversity at our campus. Just another little short clip. We saw great gains. In World History 112, which was taught in the spring of 2021, there was a 10% increase in student averages overall. So in the previous year, in the traditional face-to-face -face classroom, students performed in final grade averages, essay grades, presentation morale, as well as attendance rate at about 84%. However, in the same concurrently run online course, which was just in a Zoom format, there was also just an 84% on average achievement for students in World History 112. When we added virtual reality to our World History 112 course, we saw 94%. So that's a 10 percentage point increase by students in their achievement. So you can't see molecules, but in my virtual reality classroom where I taught advanced inorganic chemistry, you can. You can actually build 
three-dimensional representations of molecules. Our students were able to see an increase in the effectiveness of engaging content in advanced and organic chemistry at a rate of 90 plus percent. It was so great to see students actually take pride in the fact that they understood the content more. At Morehouse College on our Metaversity campus, we saw three things. Student satisfaction increased, student engagement increased, and grades increased for our students. This is just more of the same from that same video about the effectiveness of teaching chemistry in virtual reality and student impact and them saying that it was fun and interactive making these molecules and using recorded videos that were created and how interactive it was. But it's not just for uh, long distance. We are a residential program. So our students actually use these headsets in class on campus um, as well. And we also have a human cadaver lab experience that students are using to try to restore joy back into the classroom. You may be thinking, what on earth do they mean by fun? If you can look here, you'll see how engaging it is. Students can build the entire skeleton and learn every single solitary bone in the skeletal system. Not only can instructors use a camera that shows up on the screen in real time, but students can lift up organ systems out of these human cadavers and explore the actual anatomy. Have you ever been inside of a human heart? We're bringing fun back to education. So all of these things that we're doing at Morehouse that we're going to continue you may to be is helping you to get your joy back. So if you would like to join us, we would love to work with you, help you start your own metaversity program, uh, willing to collaborate. All of these fine professors are those who have helped in uh, bringing this to fruition. I, like I said, do not do this alone. We are the ultimate team because we have done this Herculean effort. Um, uh, but we also have great funders, people who have worked uh, with us, and uh, we've leveraged the power of being grant writers, right? So Southern Company, Qualcomm, Unity Technologies, Meta, uh, we use the Trip VR for our Meditation Mondays. Victory XR, our wonderful educational partners who built our Digital Twin Metaversity campus and are still building out spaces for us, uh, CEO Steve Grubbs, T-Mobile, who powers that um, Human Cadaver Lab with Fisk University um, being the first that they did it for. Our Morehouse in the Metaverse video credits um, go to HYI Productions. Um, and then our VR professors, obviously, our president and provost, Dr. David Thomas and Dr. Kendrick Brown. Our scholars who call me Dr. Mom. My family who's not on there, but I appreciate them. And then because they allow me to spend so much of my time building this in my company, Metaverse United LLC. But if you're interested in being a collaborator, reach out to me. My information is at the bottom of the slide and please visit unitethemetaverse.com to find out where I am speaking and to learn more. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Oh, oh, are you gonna go? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Morris. Um, just to kind of summarize some of the things that popped up in chat, if you weren't able to see them while you were presenting, it seemed like Emily related to your earlier experience. Uh, she said that her father was a math teacher and brought um, co first computers from his high school home on the weekends. So that was how she had her first learning experience with computers. Um, it looks like we have 
several people in the session from the University of Maryland Global Campus. Oh, wow. Hey. Um, and it says that they hey, are hey, just hey, starting hey, down their hey, metaversion yes. path. Glad to put a face with a name. All right. Um, and then I guess to kick off with questions, there was one question in the chat from Kathy Murray um, asking for John, did working in the metaverse allow him to develop his confidence and his knowledge? Yes. So what he ended up saying was first building an avatar in his likeness helped him see himself differently. That was one thing. Then build, being able to um, show up in the space as himself, but not kind of in person, made, made his stammer not be, he wasn't as anxious. That's what he was saying. He wasn't as anxious. So his ability to present information came across clearer, more succinctly, and we even saw those gains in history. So they have to present work. So we saw like on average, it go from 84% to about 94% in history when it came to their presentation grades as well. But John specifically told me that his anxiety decreased a whole lot. He said, cause he said it really wasn't that he had, he felt like he had a real speech problem. He felt like he was just so anxious that when he, when it came to him explaining his, the chemistry out loud, it just got worse. And so then people felt like he didn't know what he was talking about. He said, but he could, he could visualize it in his head. But he couldn't get it out of his mouth. So, um, but he said being his own, being an avatar and then like being in that immersive environment, it was like nothing around him but us. And he could focus, you know, he was like, I was, I was totally focused because I was in that space and I could just be myself. In that video that you all saw of him giving that clip, he didn't stutter once. If you, if you were in person with him, he couldn't have made it through that, that statement. And I watched the entire interview. That's just a clip. He didn't stammer not one time. So. All right. Okay. Looks like there's another question in the chat. Um, XR seems incredibly useful for subjects that benefit from 3D models. How do you see XR being used for classes like humanities seminars that are taught normally as discussions? wonderful because okay so what I like about it is it's synchronous the thing about discussions is you can't really moderate a discussion well but in virtual reality you can moderate a discussion very well because there are so many controls especially on the engage platform that are built in for you to be able to mute a person to start and stop a person to summon people, to sit people down, to make people have to hear people. And like people can't really walk away. They have to be in it. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of different controls and different seating arrangements that you can create to make the environment what you want it to be. You can build what you want things to, to be and to feel like for people to feel comfortable, for people to feel like they're safe, to, you know what I mean? So it's not triggering all of those kind of things for it to be more calming. Um, so whatever it is that it's going to take, especially if you're talking about something that's a real serious topic, you can create a space that is calming and soothing. You can put certain music in the background. You can kind of make it where um, it's, even if it's a heavy topic, it's not something that is going to cause trauma even you know what I mean and then you can you can actually kick people out if you want to too I mean that's always a strategy uh, <laughs> you can kick them out without like doing it in a classroom where you physically have right. to get engaged <laughs> you have to 
Yeah, because I've had to actually dismiss a student and, you know, people have been like, wow, Dr. Morris, that's savage. I mean, that's life too, but I mean, I'm, I'm a boy mom, so, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit different, you know? Yeah. Yeah, right. How is the onboarding experience for students? So, okay, so this is the thing about onboarding for me. I'm, 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 I'm a bit different. I'm an unconventional kind of teacher. I'm the kind of teacher that they are, they're allowed to check out these um, headsets. They take them home with them. I don't monitor that. You break it, you bought it. That's, that's my motto. So you take it home with you. you. I do all the disclaimer, the forms. But when they have it, I always tell them during their first onboarding session, take it, have fun. Go have fun with it. If you got your, if you got money, you buy you a game or so, you know, whatever. The reason being is students can get nauseated. You can get nauseated. You can get motion sickness from being in the headset. So I work at an all male school. You know, boys like the game. And I like that they like the game. So they get into it. And they're in dog rooms too, a lot of them. So they it ends up getting passed around, I'm sure, more than they tell me uh, a bit. Uh, and they play in it a lot. And so by the time they actually have their class session, they're old pros. So I don't have any problem with, oh, doc, I don't feel good, you know, or, I, you know, this is too much, or this is, by the time I get to a class session with them, they are doing too much, actually. Like, well, I'm like, sit, you know what? That's okay. I can lock you in your seat. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, y'all locked in. Nobody can't move. So um, they don't, they get acclimated pretty fast, but I give them permission. So I go ahead and give them permission to be on other apps, other games, do what you want with it. Have a good time. I want them to explore this space. It's new. It's cutting edge. It's emergent. So I want them to play. I want them to know that it's for fun and then that's when, when it's time for seriousness, you're not trying to have fun. So um, how long are our sessions usually? My lab class was, so chemistry is a different kind of whole thing. Our lab class is like five hours, but we weren't in it for five hours. We were in it no longer than two. The headset is untethered. We use the Oculus Quest 2 headset. It's an untethered headset, and it's going to die in two hours untethered. Now, let me tell you about boys. Boys that have allowances, refunds, money that comes their way through working or whatever will find a way to have a cable. Do you hear me? To tether to a power source to give them a little bit more juice to stay in a world a little bit longer. And my problem was never that the lesson ended. It was hey, doc, can you give us host privileges so that we could stay and go see more worlds? And I would, <laughs> that's on y'all. I'm, I'm done. The lesson is done. And if you want to stay, that, but that's between you and God. I'm, I'm out of here because I got to go cook dinner. Y'all don't have nothing to do. Happy Friday. Like, I mean, that's, that's kind of like how that would go. But what I did learn from that experience was these kids really like this. So when I taught my analytical chemistry course in the fall, I flipped the classroom. So what I did was instead of, we were still remote. We were, ver we were half hybrid, but my class was remote because we had uh, a, a building that was offline for renovation. So we needed the space and my class was small and upper level. So what we ended up doing was we usually 3D uh, print specialized lab equipment for those who have autism. That's our class culminating project. Since we didn't have the make access to the makerspace like that, we did the virtual reality project. So they had to create their own chemistry lab, their analytical chemistry lab. So what I had them do was learn everything that I learned about becoming a creator in the space. And so they got all the hosts privileges oh boy but these people they made everything 
but I let them make, first they learned how to just make things, make spaces. So they made a scary scene first. That was their first scene. They made like a, a horror film, like a forensic site. It was ridiculous. Um, with sound effects, chainsaws going, skulls and crossbones. And I was scared out of my mind. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's real footage of me like jumping out my skin in an avatar. Um, and then there was another one of them. They just created an entertainment set. And then another one, by the end of it, I, they would go in on their own and they had a rubric of things they needed to, to what makes a, a lab set and then what else did they need. And I mean, they were, they were doing their own thing. They were, they were ready, set, go. And I was like, because see what they have that I don't have is called time. <laughs> and I was like, so now I, I, I wrote a grant for Unity Technologies to make creators out of students. Because um, I was like, they, they, these people got too much time on their hands. Okay, I don't know what y'all could do. Y'all, instead of being consumers, y'all need to be prosumers, producers and consumers. That's what y'all do. Consume what you produce so that y'all can monetize off of this thing. And this is cutting edge emerging technology so you can leave college with a little bit more skill. Yes, it's good for you to have your degree, but if you can monetize off of this, if you can train someone else to do this too, on top of it, because if you can be a little bit innovative and entrepreneurial at the same time, now you got something. So I, my thing with Morehouse and the Metaverse is, Let's not have a seat at anyone's table. Let's build a table. This is new. Let's build it. So I'm all about building the table for, for, for these young men. Let's build the table. Let's not just sit here and consume and just be consumers and passive um, about it. Build it. You know, build, they say what? They say build it and they will come. So build the table. That's my thing. Let's see. Somebody else said something. What are the... We know that XR has a lot, a lot of challenges in terms of excellence. I know that is my heart. What are some of the benefits that you're seeing? Well, there's a lot of potential there. So I was at the American Chemical Society conference in San Diego, and I'm, I'm a crybaby, so bear with me here. I interviewed a young lady who is blind and has autism. And her parents, oh, this is deep for me. Her parents, she, she was there alone, which is a, a blessing because she can navigate the world alone. Um, her parents sent her away to a, a very intensive camp where they work with you to learn her skills. But she was saying, bye, Kathy. But she was saying um, that she... She was like, this sounds great and everything, but how does this work for someone who's blind? And it broke my heart. Because I was like, oh my God, how does it work for someone who's blind? And I was like, that had been plaguing me for a long time. Because <clears throat> um, my son, even that has autism, joystick controls for him is like, I mean, it doesn't tra hand eye coordinate. That doesn't translate for him. So, but hand, head motion, I was like, okay, but he could do like head motion, like that. You know, if he where he moves his head, that's where his body goes. That's different for even people who don't have the use of their, you know, for, who are paralyzed. You can do eye tracking or something like that. That's different. But they can see. But what if you can't see? You know, for, even for people who are deaf, you could have captions. Um, but for people who can't see, then like immersive virtual reality, like what does that mean? So then I started thinking about what about the sense of smell? I know that they're working on that, but what does that do? And then I was asking her, well, then, like, how do you use the internet? Because that was my question. Because if it's the embodiment of the internet, then how do you use the internet? And she was telling me that it's a um, text to speech um, thing that they use. And she said, but the problem is with PDFs, It'll just say PDF because it's not decoded or coded. And then she said for 
excuse me, for if there's not good alt text. And, and, and then I felt guilty because you know how like in PowerPoints and stuff, you, you, you can put a picture up and then it'll say alt text. And you just be like, you know, like, not like that, but you just like, I don't even have, I, be, I just did the PowerPoint two seconds before anyway. Like I, and I was like, I'm guilty because if she goes back and looks at the, the thing, the alt text, I didn't put alt text. So she's getting wrong information or not good enough information to help her experience what's really going on. And I was like, until we rectify that part, it'll be a hundred years past her life, which is beyond her lifetime before we even get to a place where we're accommodating her. Um, and that part hurt. So I'm not quite sure yet about blind um, experiences. I can think about smell. I can think about touch. I can think about um, motion for the blind, but I can't. I can't yet. Even Braille is is ill equipped to help them because she said they had her try out a sign, and it was supposed to say "Welcome to San Diego," and it said like "G to San Diego," and she was like, "It's not even written in Braille, right?" or something so I don't know we got a long way to go for for a lot of these things but I'm up to the task to get us as far as we can to push the needle forward uh, for as many people as we possibly can and there are other people too that are doing their best to push it forward um so you just have to you just have to understand how uh it's gonna take all of us and all of our hearts to 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 get this this thing going, but we can do it and be happy doing it. The joy is in the doing. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Morris, for answering everybody's questions, and of course for giving the wonderful talk. Um, we we're very grateful to have learned everything that you told us. Um, and also thank you to the people who attended and stuck it out to the very end. Um, if you would like to continue following Dr. Morris's work, please visit her website or check her out on LinkedIn and Twitter. Links are, will be in the chat. And please also check out the rest of the Voices of XR speaker series. Our next speaker will be philosopher David Chalmers, who will be discussing his new book, Reality Plus. This event will be Wednesday, April 6th at noon. Uh, link is also in the chat for that. And have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Y'all enjoy your Friday. It's the weekend. Woo we made it. Talk to you soon, David. Don't forget about me. <laughs>